Teshi Dele, everybody. Hello and welcome to the 17th session of our weekly virtual teachings by none other than our very dear Venerable Geshe Lakdor. So we are very fortunate yet again that we are here. It's the 17th session and some of us have come along all these 17 weeks and thank you so much for being here, coming here for the teachings and going back to practice from the teachings. Thank you so much, Keshila. Thank you. Please help us enlighten us. Thank you. <clears throat> Namaskar, Rashi Dilek. Hello. <clears throat> So today we are going to take some essential points from chapter 16, uh, whose title is How Atisha and Domdamba they did their discipline, practice of discipline and morality in a hidden way. So therefore the lines that convey the essential message of this text is as you have in the English, live well in remote and isolated places like the dead body of a wild animal. One should hide oneself and live without attachment. So we'll discuss more about this later on. But to start with, I would like to <clears throat> say a little bit about what one of the Kadamba master by the name Shao Gangwa has said. He said that today we've obtained this very precious human life with the leisure and endowment of freedom we have also met with Kalyan Mitra, or spiritual teacher. We also encountered the great vehicle of Mahayana teaching. So therefore, now is the time to prepare the bed, which is like, you know, something like preparing a nice comfortable bed for the future lives. In other words, preparing for comfort and happiness for future lives and also try to establish yourself in the path to liberation and enlightenment. So first, in order to prepare for the future lives, one should uproot the 10 non-virtuous activities and adopt the practice of the 10 virtuous practices. And in order to do that, you need to intentionally pay less attention to the many demands of this life, almost like ignoring the, this life. And in order to actualize nirvana or liberation, one's mind should completely turn away from the present cycle of existence or samsara. And in order to establish yourself in the path to enlightenment, one must train one's mind in bodhicitta. So in order to cultivate these three aspects of mind, one must accumulate merit. Because if you don't have enough store of merit, you will not be able to understand Dharma properly. Even if you get a little bit of idea or understanding, you will not be able to make it part of your daily life or you will not be able to develop it properly in your mental continuum. And even if you are able to cultivate a little bit, it will not be beneficial for you and for others. It will like, like almost like having studied history in the university or mathematics in the university. You may be quite good in some case, but that because right from the beginning, the motivation was not to purify your mind or not to help others. 
but primarily to earn your livelihood. So it will not help you or help others. And in fact, the reason that we have been wandering in this cycle existence from beginning, beginning less time is because we have not accumulated an, enough merit. And instead we have accumulated the non-merits. So in this life also, there are many things which does not come in accordance with your wish. These are all clear indications that you don't have enough store of merit. And the fact that you have not uprooted many of these non-virtuous activities. So therefore the root of all Dharma practice is proper accumulation of merit and purification of negative deeds. Two things. In the Buddhist practice of morality, we talk about three types of morality. Morality of purifying the negative deeds, morality of uh, accumulating the virtuous practices, and morality of benefiting others. So what is being said here is quite similar. And then the, the kind of boiling point here is the ceaseless streams of suffering that we are encountering in this life is because of our clinging to the, to the objects of desire in this life. As I said repeatedly earlier, the countless or non-stop running that we are doing in the, particularly in the modern day life is because of your, your craving, your desire. So therefore you need to suspend many of this pursuit to desire or object of desire. Because unless you maintain some kind of contentment, the external objects, just, just by accumulating the external objects, you will never be satisfied. As there is a saying in Tibetan that the king with all its kingdom still remains hungry. The beggar just with the stick feels happy and uh, singing and dancing on the road. So therefore, it's very, very important to lessen desire. And that is also one of the precursor uh, requisite for meditation. And he very pertinently says that the more you have objects to pursue, objects of desire to pursue in this life, then gradually you will find that you have no idea why you're doing so much running. In Tibetan we say karjuk chame, chames. Where you are running, you have no idea. You are running. We all know we are running. We all know we are very busy. But then if you sit down and ponder for a moment, why I'm so tired today, why did I why did so much running, you will, to your great dismay, you will find that much of the uh, rushed life or running that you did actually has not much meaning. You ran because others are running. Because very, very fond of, you know, becoming cut putli, you know, <laughs> to sing at the, to sing and dance at the twin of the dictates of the society. We are social animal because of that, unfortunately. And the more you do that running, the more you will encounter yourself committing negative deeds, experiencing suffering, hearing unpleasant words, all these three things will come together. And therefore you will get stuck in the quick mire of suffering. So many of this desire that you have, you need to cut it, you need to solve it. Because at the end of the day, the happiness and peace, including nirvana and enlightenment that, that we are talking about, has to be cultivated within one's own mind. None of this will come from what is outside of us. The moment you stop running after these countless desires, you don't have to then make very special effort to have peace and happiness. Because the moment you stop running after many of these you know, objects of desire, then that very moment, peace and happiness has started. That's why you will remember I, my, my mentioning earlier that the teachers like Buddha and uh, uh, Milarepa, they said, I'm happy because I have nothing. When you have nothing, the less, of course, we can't stay without anything, 
still we are you know uh, ordinary very very ordinary beginners so we need certain things but don't run more than what you really need necessities you need we are comf comfort creatures so we might need a little bit of comfortable things also but you don't have to lead a, a luxurious life right so that's important i think i told you earlier also you know I read this one uh, kind of saying, which says the birds that fly in the space, in the sky, they don't develop grasping to the space in which they fly. Why? This clearly shows we, 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 we develop this tendency to crave and you know, grasp with things that are, that are solid, that are tangible, that are, that are visible. We run after this and we get stuck with this. When you talk about emptiness or when you talk about space, it's so expensive, it's so accommodating for everybody. It doesn't make any sense to try to grasp it. And you will not also be able to grasp it because the nature of space or nature of emptiness is such that there is nothing to eliminate, nothing to affirm. It just provides you a space for doing things, space for reflecting things. So therefore, it makes perfect sense to say that the more we focus on the nature of shunyat or emptiness, the less there will be craving and grasping. The less you have craving and grasping, the more free you will be. Because grasping is actually getting stuck with something. When you don't grasp, your hands are free. And that you, you, your, your hand being free is one of the very important feature of human being. You know, many animals don't have their hands free, right? That's why in many cases, they lag behind us, you see. So, but, but, but if we use these two hands to just, you know, go around and collecting and carrying things all the time, <laughs> then, you, then you will, naturally you will get stuck, you see. And it's a, it's a plain and common sight that I, I teasingly tell my Tibetan friends also, sometimes we travel from one place to another place, sometimes we find that we carry a bag which is so full of goodies, so full of things, that it's difficult for you to put your zip properly, you see, right? And which, 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 is, which is not only, you know, not good because as I told you earlier, you know, the excess, excess baggage is charged at the airport and things like that, but not only that, you see, it, it will not be easy for you to find things, you know, uh, like that. So all this clearly shows that we are so much after, you know, things that without many of these collections, we feel that the so-called facilities, facilities are not there and things like that. There are four great teachers like the Tibetan teacher, Kongtang Tembe Dome. He very powerfully, he said, even if something has the name of a facility, but if that so-called facility is obstructing your spiritual practice, then it is not a facility, but it is an invitation extended to you by the evil force. So it's, it's an invitation sent to you by the evil force. <laughs> so so, so the so-called facilities are not facilities at all, but they are obstructions. They are obstructions, right? Because the more things you have, the more you're inviting evil force, the more you're inviting thieves, the more you're inviting robbers, the more you're inviting rats, you know? Because, because with the food also, the more we have in the food, the more cockroaches will come, you know, other <laughs> house flies will come, rats will come. This is, a, this is something that we all know, you see? But the, the, the less you have, the cleaner you will be, easier you will be. You know, very easy to go to this place, that place, whatever you want to do, you're, you're, you're free, right? So therefore, uh, lessening the desire is very, very important, very, very important. So therefore, that, that can be done through practice. And practice, not in a big city, unless you're spiritually advanced, but uh, practice, if possible, in a separate place of solitude. If not possible, at least you should stay just in your home 
as we are doing now, we are a little bit trained because of the COVID-19 experience, right? So we learned a lot actually. So it's important that you should be always with yourself. This is actually a very powerful statement to be with oneself. The more you think about your reality and then compare what you have, many of these things you have collected over the years, the so-called facilities, it may be an expensive TV or expensive car, whatever. They are all outside of you. They cannot be with you all the time. And the one that will be with you, at least in this life until you die, is your body. So you need to really take very good care of your body, including all the purjas, you know, the parts of the body and everything. You have to take very good care because that is going to be with you until you die, wherever you go. The rest of the things, they cannot be with you even when you're alive, including your relatives, friends, they also cannot be with you all the time. So we should, we should not make a mistake of choosing the priorities. Then especially when we go to the mind, then even after death, what goes with you is the mind, not the body. So therefore, again, mind is important. Training the mind is therefore so, so important. In this life also, as I mentioned earlier, the one that controls you know, you and one that shows you the direction, one that guides you is your mind, not your body. So the mind which directs you, which guides you has to be something sensible, something with wisdom naturally, right? So therefore training the mind is so important. And then, as I said, we came into this world alone, we'll go, you know, to, to the next world alone. So we need to learn to be alone. It's the fact, because at the end of the day, Nobody can help you in the true sense of the term, unless your thought pattern is proper and unless your mental outlook is uh, correct, nobody can really rectify you, right? As I you know, mentioned several times before. And then in, in order to, you know, from a larger perspective, if we are to contribute a little bit towards uh, solving the countless problems that we are facing in the world, in the society, it can be done first by changing oneself one's physical attitude, mental attitude, verbal attitude, all this should be, you know, transformed. I was reading one piece, I am tempted to read this, for example, during, during the COVID-19 experience, somebody has wrote this beautifully, which is very easy to understand. As the world fights to figure everything out, we're all fighting, right, to figure out everything. Then he says, as the world fights to figure everything out, everybody has a responsibility. Now this gentleman says, what is his responsibility? As the world fights to figure everything out, I will be holding doors for strangers. Even if you're passing through a door, you know, don't just close the door, even you know, without seeing others are following you, just bump the door, not like that. As the world fight to, fights to figure out everything out, I will be holding doors for strangers letting people cut in front of me in traffic. Imagine, you know, such small things, but if everybody practices such small things, it will just completely change the world. Letting people cut in front of me in traffic, saying good morning, you see, you will lose nothing saying good morning, keeping babies entertained in grocery lines, stopping to talk to someone who is lonely, nobody to talk to, being patient with the sales clerks, or your taxi, you know, whatever, you know, sometimes we immediately like we get wild and eh, yeah, eh. you know, I do this all the time, you know, unfortunately. So we, we should, you know, smiling at a passer, passerby. And then he says, why? Why should you do this? Because I will not stand idly by and live in a world where love is invisible. So through this kind of small gestures, we need to make love visible. Not just saying I have love and compassion, I pray for you, it's somewhere down in my heart, not like that. It may be there, it's good, but, but if you really have it, it will automatically come out through many of your you know, life's gestures, life's activities. So because I will not stand idly by and live in a world where love is invisible. Join me in showing kindness, understanding and judging less, judging less, don't judge other people. Who are you to judge? And you will not, never be able to judge other people. You know? 
and be kind to a stranger. Give grace to friends who are having a bad day. When somebody is having a bad day, your, your company and your chatting and your offering come up to you to completely change that person. I've that experience myself. Be forgiving of yourself also. You know, you immediately, we, just like we are, we are ordinary human beings, we easily, easily get, you know, sad and uh, uh, unhappy, you know. Then, then you think, think again about the positive things that you have. You know, why I'm rushing? Why I'm so upset? You think like this, why, why, why should I do this? When I have all these wonderful things with me, then immediately your mind changes. You become calm and happy. And when your mind is calm and happy, you're able to deal with every situation much, much, much easily. And these days, actually, I'm practicing that in my, not in a you know, meditation seat, <laughs> but in my work. I check myself when I'm, I'm unnecessarily getting like excited or about to say something negative or about to do something negative or unnecessarily running. Then, and then I call myself, why, why the hell are you running? Just come down, do it slowly. And in many, many, many a times you'll find that the, the more properly and slowly you do, you don't have to repeat that work. You know, you do it one time, you do it properly. If you hurriedly try to do something, then you, you know, just for example, if you hurriedly typing something, make a mistake, and then I can retype, you know, the same thing, you see. So do it properly, things like that. You know, be forgive of yourself. Today and every day, forgive yourself. So be the change, be the light. Start today and never stop. So this, this, uh, these are wonderful teachings. You know, start from small things that we can do. You, you, can't, you can't achieve nirvana in one day or enlightenment in one day. But if the more and more you get habituated doing these good things, the more and more you get that, you know, satisfaction that every day you count, count the blessing, count the good things that you do. You know, not just I finish this work. Okay, you finish that work and you might get your salary. This is all, okay, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is if somebody came asking for something, if you have just given a good answer or somebody looking for a, you know, book, you know, you had, you, you will either borrow that book or you just give that book to that person, whatever, small gestures, you know, through their way. And it is my own personal experience. And you know, even in one day, even under this lockdown, you almost every day get an opportunity to something, do something good for almost everybody. So many people, you know, we, 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 live, with people, we live with people, you see. So we talk to people, you know. So, how, you know, there's so much opportunity. And when you do that, then you get satisfied. Okay, today my life is meaningful. Today my life is meaningful. The salary, some of you will get it, unfortunately, these days, whether you work or not work. You know, there are many ways of like cheating the, you know, things and you will get the salary, but that, that will not give you satisfaction. You need that, but that will not give you satisfaction. Do something that will give you satisfaction and that will open the door for many other positive deeds and then gradually deeper and deeper into spiritual practices. Okay. So let us, you know, read a little bit about this chapter. How, how did Adisha and Dondomba started this, you know, dialogue in this particular chapter. So Dom Damba again, of course, is an enlightened being, Dom Damba. And in this book, you will see, you know, very often while they are talking, they suddenly disappear, reappear in the rainbow form, in a form of Avalokiteshvara, in the form of Buddha, you know. It's just, just I'm not, not reading all this. It's very confusing also, you know. People may not be able to appreciate that also. So I'm not trying to read that also. But they, they, they are highly, highly enlightened beings. But so therefore, the, the, the questions that Dumtumba is asking Atisha is on our behalf, on the behalf of his future students, how, how people should practice. So he always asks very pertinent questions in simple languages. So the first question that he asks is, ask is uh, for a practitioner, for a Dharma practitioner, which place is bad or not good for practice? Then Dom I mean, it's very, you know, straight away question, straight away, straight away answer. Then uh, Atisha answered this by saying that the place, bad place for a Dharma practitioner is the great prison of your fatherland or motherland. The great prison of your fatherland and motherland, you see. The so-called fatherland and motherland 
for which we develop so-called nationalism and which so become so fanatic and things like that from a you know, practitioner's point of view, that so-called fatherland, motherland is a great prison. Now, again, don't misunderstand this. Just as we are constantly encouraged to develop love and compassion to everybody. So of course, everybody in your fatherland, motherland, things like that. But in terms of uh, spiritual impediment and obstruction, your, your fatherland, your motherland, and then you come closer and closer, especially to your family members, right? The so-called brother, sister, husband, wife, all this. You know, they are not, I'm not saying they're intentionally try to, trying to destroy your you know, spiritual practice, things like that. But, but when, when, <laughs> when ordinary people live together, you know, they, you know what, when we, we go with people, what do we share? We only share what we have. So therefore, the, when, we, when we are with our family member, with the ordinary society, they will share, unfortunately, the bad things, the unpleasant things, the negative things, because they, they, they know only this. For example, if you're in company with His Holiness Dalai Lama or in company with the Milarepa, they will share knowledge, they share their enlightenment, they share their quality, right? So they, they don't know, even, even a mother who has so much love and affection to the child, she can share only what she, what she knows, right? So therefore the problem arises in the world, you know, because the so-called education or knowledge that we get is based on that little knowledge that everybody has. So therefore don't get stuck, obsessed with the so-called fatherland, motherland, your home and so forth. Second question he asks that, uh, who is a bad friend for a Dharma practitioner? He says the bad friend is somebody who is completely again stuck in the uh, ordinary worldly human activities. Ordinary worldly human activities. See, so we are surrounded by those people who are, who are completely stuck in ordinary worldly activities, right? So this you can, this you can see everywhere in India, in America, you know, how much we, we are stuck in so many things, right? And then he, the third question he asks is, is, what is the, the binding uh, force or binding uh, something like a rope for a Dharma practitioner? This is the one that will become a bondage to the Dharma practitioner is, partisanship, biased mental attitude, which is again true. Because if we look carefully, then you're always siding with somebody. You're, you side with your relatives and friends. You side with your own people. You side with your own religion and then start fighting for others who do not belong to your religion, to your family, to your society. That's how division takes place. That's how you know, unending fighting is happening in today's world belonging to this political party, that party, that this religion, that religion. So, so therefore, that is, the, that is the big bondage. So from, from this, we should learn that having a mind of partiality, a biased attitude is very, very disruptive and unhealthy. I recall Shanta Rakshita saying that when the mind is biased, he will not experience peace, which is true. Now you can look at the, the election in America <laughs> because of this biased <laughs> attitude. I'm not saying who is right, who is wrong, but definitely the mental bias is there. So now everybody is feeling threatened and unhappy. They are not happy in having peace, right? So when your mind is biased, even in the case of those who have the power, who are controlling, because their mind is biased, Externally, it appears that they have all the control, they are in peace, but they don't have the peace. They constantly feel threatened because of their own doing, because of their own mental attitude, right? And especially when we talk about developing emptiness, understanding the way things are. You know, if you really want to understand the way things are, how can you approach that, that, that the, you approach, how can you, you know, try to understand that, that reality 
that the way things are through a biased attitude, impossible. It's only impartial mind, impartial scrutiny. You will be able to see the way things are, right? So therefore, whether you're a Buddhist practitioner or you're a scientist, in order to understand the fact, understand the reality, the number one quality needed is that your mind should be unbiased, right? So for your peace and for understanding the way things are, your mind must be unbiased. And what kind of food is bad for a Dharma practitioner? Next question. This is answered by saying, wrong livelihood. As we discussed earlier, the five types of wrong livelihood. So all those you know, wrong livelihoods that you have earned, now today we can use the word like things that you've earned through corruption, through exploitation, through bullying, you know, through cheating, through stealing. You know, stealing means, you know, you need to understand it from a bigger perspective. Stealing doesn't mean that, that you know, st stealing doesn't mean just burglary. Stealing means without paying much attention to the government property or the office property, if you take something away like that, you know, use it, that is stealing. So we need to be really, really careful. So stealing basically means burglary, robbing, you know, so stealing basically means taking what you do not own. Taking what you do not own. Even if it is something lying outside, you know, if, you, if that thing doesn't, you don't own that thing, you're not supposed to even plug a flower. For example, if it is a garden of the public garden, you know, it's for everybody, you know. It is not owned by one individual, one family, but it's owned by the larger society. So you're not supposed to, you know, even pluck a flower, right? So therefore, because if you get used to it, depending on wrong livelihood, it will obscure your mind. Then having contaminated your mind, even if you pretend to be meditating, pretend to be memorizing something, pretend to be doing some prayer, because of lack of clarity of your mind, nothing much will stay in your mind. That's for sure, that's for sure. So it's, it's a kind of pollution, it's a contamination that you will get, right? Then the next question asked is, Dom Domba says, please, please say more, say more. And uh, then, then <laughs> uh, Adisha answers, study all the Vinaya text, meaning that all those teachings that is found in the monastic discipline texts, you know, Vinaya texts, from the beginning to the end, they are all for practice. You study them. So that also indirectly indicates or tells that if you really want to understand Dharma properly and know what to practice and what to, know, what to do and what not to do, then you need to have a fuller knowledge of the whole Vinaya text, all, all the three Pitakas. Then the next question asked is, which kind of behavior is a bad behavior for a Dharma practitioner? This is answered in a very simple way by saying, unnecessarily running, unnecessarily jumping, unnecessarily sleeping, unnecessarily eating, unnecessarily drinking. All these are bad behaviors. Meaning that for a Dharma practitioner, the way he walks, the way he talks, the way he eats food, everything should be like peaceful. It should be reflected in his or her behavior. I think that's the meaning. And then Dom Dhamma says, please say more, say more. <laughs> Please say more. Then he says, you should study all the three pitakas. This is what Atisha told Dhamdhamba, but indirectly, Atisha is telling all of us to study three pitakas. Are you, are you ready to study all the three pitakas? The first answer I'm sure that I will get is, I don't have the three pitakas. <laughs> right? 
So for the Tibetans who are interested, three Pitakas are available in Tibetan language. You can go to a library and read it. It's also, I think, available in English, now translation. But if you, may, if you have the desire, if you have the interest, you can, nowadays you can have all these things. Some of this probably may be downloadable also. But then, you know, our not making effort towards these things is one clearly showing where our main interest lies, right? For example, in terms of getting a job, you will just move the mountain, you know? Ignoring the COVID-19, whatever, you will move from Delhi to Dramsala, Dramsala to Delhi, you know, whatever, you will do everything. But in terms of such practice, you will not be, you will not be ready even to go to three kilometers to study there. So how are we going to make great spiritual practice if that is our endeavor, that is our interest, right? So interest is very important. As I said, in Buddhism, making effort means rejoicing and delighting in what you do, just like a football player, you see. And if you have that interest, you can easily, easily study, learn, easily practice also. Right? Okay. And then he asked another question by saying, among the many enemies, which one is the worst? Adish answers this by saying the worst enemy is the negative friends. Negative friends who will, in whose association he will completely destroy you. As I mentioned earlier, that the so-called negative friends will not come to you with horns on the head or wearing, you know, uh, loose black garments or bearing fangs uh, or mouthful of, you know, human blood. <laughs> it will not come like that. They'll, they'll come in a very friendly manner. They'll also look after many of your expenses and things like that, you know, count on me, let's go there, go there, you know, things like that. But unfortunately in this way, by being mirthful and playful and, you know, you join them and you go into the wrong direction. You may be somebody who doesn't smoke, then gradually start smoking. You may not be drinking, gradually start drinking. You know, again, that person, I'm not saying that person has the intentionally, intentionally trying to destroy you, but as I said, that person can share only what he has. So you, you, when you associate with other people, you need to, you need to see carefully what, what I'm going to get with this from this person. Not, not to take advantage from them, but, but to protect yourself and to get the good qualities from that person. As the Tibetan saying goes, if you recline against mountain dust, mount, you know, mountain with a lot of dust, all you will get is dust. If you recline against a mountain full of gold, the gold dust will stick to you. And especially we are a very ordinary person. So friend, with, with what kind of person you make that friendship is, very, 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 very crucial. <laughs> so I said very, very many times. Because we don't have much control over ourselves, you know. So we, we go by the examples, right? So society is important. Friends are important. So that's why we should all, on the one hand, make effort to, you know, transform that society, that neighborhood into a, you know, congenial atmosphere, right? It's important, very important. And, and when we, we are in a state, when we do not have the capacity and power to transform others, then at least we should make sure that you are not misled by others. And then he asked another question by you. What are the obstructive factors for somebody who is the wow? For example, in the case of a monk, 
or none the vow. Then he says, then the, the then the uh, the uh, the strongest obstructive force, for example, in the case of a monk, is women. Similarly, in the case of a nun, is a man, right? And what is the best way of serving the Lama? Atisha answers this by saying the best way of serving, serving the Lama is that you live a life so that whatever you do becomes a good Dharma practice. Whatever you do becomes a good Dharma practice. If you do that, you are really serving the Lama. You will recall that there are many ways of serving the Lama, the, like, like offering money, offering material goods, or you know, uh, serving him you know, physically, like cooking for that person, or washing his clothes, whatever, and things like that. There are many things they do. But in, in all the texts, they say out of all these different kinds of offering, the best offering is offering of practice. So that is what he's saying here, right? Whatever you do, it should become a good Dharma practice. That's the best way of serving the teacher. Now the today the problem is, the Lama may want material offerings from the students. The students are not making any material offering. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, topsy-turvy, <laughs> right? And actually the thing should be, the Lama should not expect any offering, material offering from the student, but the Lama is expecting, students are not giving. The students should be voluntarily of making those offerings, but they are not giving. So, <laughs> so, so, so therefore this teaching becomes very, very important. You know, you don't have to, you know, make their relationship with by material offerings, but do your spiritual practice properly. Whatever you do, make sure it becomes a dharma practice. Then, if that lama is a really good lama, qualified lama, you will be happy. And even if that lama is not good lama, then it's okay. He doesn't deserve your material offerings. You played your part. You see, you are doing good things, so you will benefit. It will also should benefit the lama a little bit. You see, so that's really like if you look more. Deeply, a wonderful, wonderful practice. Then again, Dom Domba, because we, we make these mistakes, you know, we always think material offering is the most important thing. So therefore, even after Atisha tells Dom Domba that you, you do, all, do, you know, whatever you do, it should become Dharma practice. That is the best offering. Then, then again, Dom Domba asks us, what is, isn't the material offerings and serving the, serving the teacher is not a good thing? Huh? Then, then, almost like re re rebuffing that caution, Atisha says, these are all done by, because this is a discussion more among enlightened beings, you know. She says, this kind of material offering and uh, physically we serving somebody, this even, even ordinary householders do all the time. Like family members do this among each other and things like that. So it's some, not something you know very important, something very special. Then again, don't ask a question. Are you saying that then it's okay not to do any of these things? Right? And then he says, if you intentionally ignore and not do these things, that it means you have no respect to the teacher. <laughs> so that again is another a kind of extreme, you see. So what we are saying is, out of these many types of offering, offering or practice is the most important thing. But then as a kind of a, a symbolic or representative or polite way of, not only with the Lama, but dealing with other human beings, you know, not just thinking and thinking, but you also show some good gestures, and I think that's also a good thing, right? Then he asked another question by saying, what are the omens, omens, which shows the, the monkhood is now about to be destroyed? Then he says, somebody in the case of a monk or a nun who constantly stays in a 
in a in a monastery sorry stays in a in a household with the lay people then there's the indication there's the, there's the omen of the coming to an end of that monkhood or nunhood Dumdumba feigning that he did not understand this, he said, he asked again by saying then, at that time, what kind of fault will be there? What kind of fault will arise? Then he said, the fault is that if you, a monk, ordained monk or nun, lives with household life, you know, ordinary people, then your abode and your, uh, your, your acharya will be your brothers and your sisters and your parents, you know, not the real abode or real acharyas but this your abbots and acharyas who give you the vows and things like that, they, they will all be replaced by your relatives, brothers, sisters, parents, and so forth. And because of this, instead of developing your, you know, practice of listening to the teaching or thinking about this, you will be focusing on how to increase your wealth, uh, your family prestige, and things like that. And then gradually in your heart, you will long for the, the sweet, sweetheart. The young girl or young man or things like that. And then when you actually meet that young man or young woman, then you, you two, the two of them will, you know, kind of, uh, kind of deceive each other by a gentle smile and gentle physical <laughs> facial expression. <laughs> then, then you get stuck there. And you will, in fact, not only get lost in it, but for a time being, for the time being, you will start thinking, oh, what an amazing life. My family's property is increasing. I got a nice young, young women, nice young men, things like that. You will see it as something amazing. And then gradually, your celibacy will be lost. And then people will, once you have lost your celibacy, then people will love it. You make fun of you, saying that this is fake monk, a fake nun. Right? So your dawn, dawn fall has already started. Again, Dumdamba asks a question by saying, no, sorry, then he says, then if you lead such a life, then when you die, you will go to the negative state of existence. And then Dumdamba asks Atisha, okay, now in my case, where should I go? What, which place is the right place for me to stay? Then he answers, as we already read, that you should live in a place of isolation. Then he asks another question, what should be my way of dying? Then as we already read, your way of death should be like the death of a wounded animal. And fanning that he did not understand, again, Dom Dabba asked, in that, in the case of a wounded animal, how, how that animal dies? He answers this by saying that the wounded animals, they, they just die in an isolated place and they, they, they hide their own dead body by themselves or something like that. Then who will do all these rituals after the death? The rituals of, rituals of burning the, you know, the bones and the things like that. Then he says, in the, in the case of a good practitioner, you don't need all these formal ritual practices. If you're somebody who has observed morality, that practice of morality will do, is equal to having performed all the ritual practices. In fact, much more, much more beneficial. And at that time, is there any need for presence of a human being at that time to do to all these rituals and things like that? He says, no, there's no need. Because the one who will be constantly looking after you, after your death, is the, the three ratna, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Then again, Tom Dabba asked him, are you sure that Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha will take, up, take care of me after my death? Then Atisha answers, if they are not there, then what is, what is the use of these three? When are, we, when are we going to use them? So therefore, you should understand this Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha are your permanent object of refuge. Permanent object of refuge means 
refuge when you are alive, a refuge when you die. So therefore, the first something like fire puja when you die is practice of morality. Second is not to have any attachment when you die. Third is through your spiritual practice, you should have obtained a secure place from where there's no falling back. And fourth is your, your protecting the samsara, people who are wandering in the samsara. And fifth is you should be at a level where you have abandoned all those that needs to be abandoned and have developed all those realizations that must have been developed. So in short, all these virtuous practices must be done by oneself. Nobody can help you in this. So if you do these practices properly, you don't need any of these ordinary things that we do during the dead and so forth. So these are these are the some of the primary teachings. And then after that, he actually uh, again some uh, miraculous performances take place between them. And uh, then Atisha makes a prophecy about the place where Dhamma should move and build. And so as, as, pro, as, as was the prophecy in Dom Dhamma later on, built that beautiful Rending Monastery. And he, Atisha compares Rending Monastery as a, as a really like heavenly abode with all the, you know, uh, heavenly qualities that is available. And he says that all this is there in that Rending place, but it will be visible only to those people who have certain spiritual realization, not by everybody. And then he says, even for ordinary people, if you look at the place, you look at the water that you use, look at the flowers and everything, it's a very, very unique place. So this is how he highlights the great many qualities of uh, uh, that place reading. And he asks his Dom Dhamma to take special care of that place, build the monastery and give, gives the prophecy that later on his followers will multiply and many, many eminent followers uh, will come uh, to be able to preserve and transmit this uh, uh, Kadamba lineage. So before I close, we have a few more minutes. I am tempted to read a little bit about this uh, practice in isolation, because he, he said that uh, live well in remote and isolated places, like the dead body of wild animal. One should hide oneself, now you know the meaning very well, and live without attachment, most important at the time of death, and also otherwise lessen your attachment. We discussed this. Then I came across a very, very interesting article you know, I, I, I download so many interesting articles from good resources, okay? Not, not everywhere. So, so, so this morning, because I was early morning thinking a little bit over today's talk, and I just quickly glanced through some of the beautiful articles, you know, that I downloaded. And I, I, I expected that something in line with today's teaching will be, should be there. And immediately I found one which talks about the six kinds of loneliness. I hope if you just type that, you should be able to get that article, six kinds of loneliness. When I started reading that text, he explains all these six kinds of loneliness with beautiful description in the modern day language. Then I said, 
look what he explains this six kind of loneliness. It's really familiar to me. This is exactly what uh, Kamala Sheila said in his stages of meditation. I immediately was able to, you know, kind of suspect that. Then immediately, like, I have that text, stages of meditation in Tibetan, also translated by myself in English a long time back. Just line by line, they're all there exactly. So the point that I'm making is that there are many prerequisites for doing meditation in general, and especially doing calm abiding meditation. So there, uh, Kamala Shila explained these six points. Now this 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 uh, talk actually by Pema Chodron. So she's being a Buddhist, must have read that text. But the way she explained is really beautiful. And starts by asking the question that is enlightenment the ultimate loneliness? She's saying this because to be without a reference point is the ultimate loneliness for us, right? We The so-called loneliness is there with us because as and when we don't have a reference point. So to be without reference point is the ultimate loneliness and it is called enlightenment. In the middle way, there is no reference point. The mind with no reference point does not resolve itself, does not fix it or grasp, as I said, the bird flying in the space does not have that grasping. We, how could we possibly have no reference point? This is how we think, ordinary people think. So think about emptiness. Sounds good. But we, 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 we don't know how to do that because we always are habituated with relating to an, a reference, reference point. So to have no reference point would be to change a deep-seated habitual response to the world, wanting to make it work out one way or the other. If I can't go left or right, I will die. When we don't go left or right, we feel like we are in a detox center. We are alone, cold, cold turkey with all the edginess that we have been trying to avoid by going left or right. That edginess can feel pretty heavy, so and so forth. So I, I, I am not trying to read everything. It's a long article. But he, he calls all this, you know, pretty uh, good for meditation. He emphasizes on the middle way. And saying that uh, we suffer because we are not able to stay in the middle way, not able to meditate on emptiness. And then all the prerequisites for meditation, like having less desire. She says that this is another name for loneliness, less desire. And she calls that not just ordinary loneliness, she, she calls that cool loneliness. Less desire is important. It's a cool loneliness. Contentment is another, the second kind of loneliness is contentment. When we have nothing, we have, the, the beauty is when we have nothing, we have nothing to lose. We don't have anything to lose, but being programmed in our guts to feel we have a, we have a lot to lose. This is how we think. Then avoiding unnecessary activities. The third kind of loneliness is avoiding unnecessary activities. That is a prerequisite. When we are lonely in a hot way, we look for something to save us. We look for a way out. We get this queasy feeling that we call loneliness and our minds just go wild trying to come up with compa uh, companions to save us from despair. That is called unnecessary activity. It's a way of keeping ourselves busy so we don't have to feel any pain, <laughs> right? It could take the form of obsessively daydreaming of true romance or turning a tidbit of gossip into the six o'clock news or even going off by ourselves into the wilderness. So these are all like uh, getting into unnecessary activities, which must be stopped if you want to achieve that one point of concentration. A Japanese poet Ryokan says, if you want to find the meaning, stop chasing after so many things. Absolutely right. Stop chasing. Then complete discipline. Another prerequisite. 
Complete discipline is another component of cool loneliness. Complete discipline means that every opportunity we are willing to come back, just gently come back to the present moment. Things like that. I'm not going to read everything. And then no wandering in the world of desire. No wandering in the world of desire is another way of de describing cool loneliness. Wandering in the world of desire involves looking for alternatives, seeking something to comfort us, food, drink, people. The word desire encompasses that addiction quality, addiction quality. This is a beautiful way of putting things, you know. The more we go after things, the more we get addicted. I like honey, I like this, I like that. You know, that means you are getting, getting addicted, okay? The way we grab, the, grab for something because we want to find a way to make things okay. Then finally, not seeking security from one's discursive thoughts. We are seeking security in the discursive thoughts, conceptions. We run after conceptions, right? The wild conceptions. Just as there are objects, similar number of conceptions arise. And that is how uh, we suffer. So another aspect of cool loneliness is not seeking security from one's discursive thoughts. The rug's been pulled. The jig is up. There is no way to get out of this one. We don't even seek the companionship of our own constant conversation with ourselves about how it is and how it is not, whether it is or whether it is not, whether it should or whether it should not, whether it can or whether it cannot. With cool loneliness, we do not expect security from our own internal chatter. That is why we are instructed in meditation to label it thinking. It is no objective reality. It is transparent and ungraspable. We are encouraged to just touch the chatter and let it go. Be the observer, see the beautiful, you know, things happening and not to make much ado about nothing. So things like that. So you can, I hope you can download that article and read it. It's a beautiful reading. All right, so I have done my duty today. <laughs> so what is it, Chen? Thank you, Gishila. Now we have some questions. And first of all, we'd like uh, to request uh, Chaya to please ask your question. She had sent a request earlier. Chaya. Okay. Chaya. She is not yeah. tired. She has to unmute. Wait. Acha, you, uh, you have to okay, accept okay, okay, the, bone stain. the unmute request. Now you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay. Hello, Geshela. How are you? Yeah, no. <laughs> so nice to see you and thank you for the teaching. So nice to see you. Shalom, shalom. <laughs> Keshela, I would ask, would like to ask you about the topic of bad friend. Oh. Because um, I see two um, approach. Mm. Of, from, from, one, uh, from one hand, the approach that we learn at the eight verses for training the mind. Yes. To see the what we call bad friend, the one who gives our challenges yes. as our lama that we put at the crown of our head and opportunity yes. to see our short shortcoming yes, yes. comes and to deal with it. And at the other <coughs> hand, like Atisha say, says here, the worst enemy is the negative friend. Yes. So how to, this is the question. Yeah, even in the enemy, on the one hand, because of its destructiveness, we call that person enemy. But then on the other hand, we say enemy is our best teacher for patience, practice of patience. So similarly, it's it's a perspective, you know, how you see things. So with, with the negative friends also, as I said earlier, that make sure that you are not kind of uh, uh, destroyed or harmed by the influence of the negative person. So from that person, perspective he's kind of enemy but then from the perspective of just being an ordinary you know person uh, deserving compassion deserving help like any other sentient being 
of course that person is an object of compassion object of love so so in this case you know the the best example that i could put forth as i normally used to do citing from the teaching of uh, 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 Kamala Shila stages of meditation where he says that when you associate with people then the way you maintain your relationship should be like the way you you know maintain relationship with fire okay if you go too close to the fire and use your hand to touch the fire it will burn your hand so don't go too close but if you you stay too far away you will not get the comfort of the fire the warmth of the fire so always i think this is a very good example you know in human relationship we should maintain some kind of distance right so i think i think that is the point yeah and another small small question can i very small question yeah you you mentioned three kind of ethics one of good deed Yeah. good deeds one of uh, avoiding negative deeds and one of uh, benefiting others absolutely and i wonder the difference with, between the good deeds and the avoiding and the benefiting others benefiting others is uh, included in good deeds okay but the emphasis is made so that you know your so called good for example reciting mantra and other things are uh, good deeds but at the end of the day all this the purpose of all these good deeds the purpose of refraining from all negative deeds is to help other sentient beings to emphasize on this point the third kind of morality is being explained yeah thank you keshe you thank you thank you thank you hmm? sorry now we have question from uh, natasha hmm? Thank you very much thank you very much for your teaching uh we have today about 80 persons watching and uh, rather listening to the russian translation we have two questions the first one is uh why is restraint or maybe chasteness so important after after all human nature is about interacting with the opposite sex isn't it mm. yeah but what did you say restraint Yeah, restraint or chasteness. I, I, I understand that it it means that uh, you have restraint from the relationships with the opposite sex, or you no, know this part. No, no, no. No. In, in Buddhism, it is never said don't marry. Okay, in Buddhism, what is objected is adultery. Right, the wrong ways of you know having relationship with the other sex. but uh, it is never said that marriage is bad right so like any other human relationship the relationship has to be healthy you should not try to take advantage of the other whatever be the reason if you do that then it cannot be a healthy relationship but when you maintain a healthy relation not even like opposite sex but even with the the parents and the the their children and so forth you know the relation should also be healthy one but the parents try to exploit the, the children the children try to exploit <laughs> parents then even that relationship is not just sex you know even the relation is she is unhealthy relationship so from that point of view yeah um and the second question is um dinari is asking uh, there is a question that bothers me mm. i wonder is it good or no uh when you have to pay to receive the teachings mm. sometimes it is a fixed amount like an entrance ticket mm. sometimes it's just a free donation mm. uh maybe this is the possibility for generosity or is it something different it depends who is the organizer honestly speaking there are many ways of collecting money <laughs> so sometimes clever in a clever way sometimes in a more direct way indirect way you know and in some cases it may be like sincere thing you know for example if it is a small dharma center who is struggling to survive they also need some money you know the the the, the people who organizing it may be really sincere and very highly motivated but 
uh, money makes maya go, you know. So without money, they, they don't have that spiritual realization to, you know, uh, bring down a shower of uh, dollars from the space. So the only way is again to expect something from other the, other people. But then, you know, the, the healthy way is just, just leave it for the people. If they want to donate, donate. You know, not only donate, but they can donate like donate like ten thousand dollars, whatever. If they have the money, no problem. You see, this is not something like uh, strange because we we squander our money in so many other places. So why not here? You know, right? So then, in the case of uh, people who don't have the money, they should not feel pressed to, you know, to give something, right? Then it becomes healthy. So even if you like, for example, fix a rate, whatever be the reason, hopefully it should be a good reason. If there's a good reason to fix the rate, then you should also say those people who can pay, please. Those who cannot, it's okay. I think that should be made. Then from the people who attend the teaching also, they should not just, just say, oh, Dharma should be made free, you know, and therefore they're not making Dharma free. Therefore I'm, I, I don't want to give, you know, things like that. Because as I said, you know, for many other stupid things, you are quite lavish, you know, you, you are ready to pay so much money. And I have this experience in Dharamsala itself, because in the library, we sell books, you know, publish books and sell books. And if, if people come and ask how, how, how much is this book, we say 200 rupees, oh, very costly. Then the next moment they go to the taxi stand and pay 100 rupees up, 100 rupees down, 200 rupees, just, just like that in 10 minutes, you see. So there's, there's human attitude, you know? So the, the attitude from both the side should be uh, mature to see the pros and cons and everything. And then of, course, then of course, whether it's your rela making relation with the teacher or renting a teaching, if you don't feel like going, then don't go. Nobody will force you to go or do those things. And especially if it is a like bad teacher or bad dharma center, it's it's best not to go, right? If if you really think it's a good teacher, good dharma center, then you also have a responsibility to not only to take the the, the things from there, but also contribute to the flourishment of the, the dharma center for the people who are doing things. You know, unfortunately, in in the in the today's society, many people who want to do many good things, they they are, they are shortage of funds, unable to do anything. And the politicians and many others who are, you know, they, they have so many ways of like taking huge amount of money from everybody, you see. And we are no exception, you know, we, how much money we pay for the so-called taxes, this tax, that tax, we tax, we tax, we tax, we tax, tax, so many taxes we are paying, you see. Right? So every small, the, the other day I was listening to a commentary on the, the system of paying taxes and so forth. Then this person, he gives a very good explanation by saying there's nobody, the poorest of the poor, who does not pay tax. Because tax doesn't mean that somebody comes and collects their tax from you. It means, you know, the things that you buy, every small thing that you buy, you're paying tax with their things. You see? So, so we're losing money in many ways, in different ways. You know, we are not even aware that we are being cheated. Right? So it, so it is worthwhile to contribute to something that is uh, beneficial to many people. So <laughs> that is my feeling. <laughs> yeah, so thank you, Gishla. Thank you, Natasha. Please thank your friends for us. Yeah. And next we have Nili. Hi, Nili. You can ask your question now. I've sent you the unmute request. Hi, hello. Yes, how are you? Yeah. Yeah, well, first of all, as, as always, you know, really, I feel very lucky to have your meaningful teachings, you know, I guess all of us. Yeah. So thanks again. Now, my question is, how can you really, in a sort of practical level, you know, in daily life, apply, um, you know, the notion of, of love and compassion or emptiness? Um, when you have a concrete problem and the other side is really doesn't have this sort of attitude. I give an example, you know, a small example can be like, I don't know, a, 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 a parking ticket that you got for $100 
and then you don't really think that you did anything wrong, but the other side, you know, they don't care, they want you to pay. Or even a bigger thing, like the Chinese codes, you know, that oppress all minorities, mm. and they don't really have this attitude. So mm. how can you really apply, um, you know, and in these cases, for instance, um, your attitude? Yes, yeah. very good question you know, if we have this attitude? Very good question. So my answer is neither the Buddha nor His Holiness nor anybody said Buddhist practice is easy that we need to understand. It's not easy. Why it is not easy? Because the majority of the people are not in that line of practice. So they will continue with this stupid, you know, ways of living. So when you try to practice that in that society, and in, 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 in a way unmatured society, it's not easy. But not being, not easy is not a reason not to practice it. Right, because especially in your case, now you have sensed how good loving kindness is, how good compassion is. So because of that, even if it's a little bit difficult, difficulty, I, 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 I can watch for you that it will not be difficult all the time. Sometimes it is difficulty, like the parking lot, whatever you said, things like that. It's not always like that, right? So in some cases, when you face some kind of difficulty, then in some cases, you, you can sacrifice that small irritation, things like that, let that other person take advantage of it. We can do that. But in other cases, to practice love and compassion doesn't mean that you let others exploit you without losing, without forgetting your love and compassion to that person. You have every right to stand for what is true, what is just. So, so try your best to stand firm for that without, you know, resorting to violence or as my, again, it's not easy, of course, on the spot, we'll get angry, things like that. But as much as possible, try to remain calm and explain things. Even there, sometimes the other who is the power might take advantage of you. Okay, it's one thing, one time, it's, it's not necessary all the time. But you should, through that way, then try to create more awareness among the people so that all this, those, you know, people who have the law in their hand and who misuse the law, that, that gradually, that, that group gradually dwindles. So that is, that is the purpose of our practice. You see, we cannot change the society at one go. The, the point is that society is not moving in the right direction. There are unnecessary problems. There are cheaters, there are looters, there are exploiters, things like that. So we need to change it and we cannot change it one day. Because of this reason, we, can, we should not and we cannot just forego our practice. So we need to make the at attempt and show an example to the younger generation so that the next younger generation, you know, with the next you know, younger generation will be much better. So there lies the hope. And one, like, I think quite a good example that I tell people is, for example, if somebody, is, somebody jumps from a ninth floor and commits suicide, is it wrong? Yes, of course it is wrong. Now, because of that, because that person jumped from the ninth floor and committed suicide, and in fact, not one, but many people did that. Then, because of these reasons, we should also join them and jump, jump from the ninth floor and to commit suicide. <laughs> we should not. So that, that's almost like that, you see. So when it comes to practice of love and compassion, practice of uh, uh, honesty and uh, being just and things like that. It is not a question of majority and minority. It's a question of who is right, who is wrong. So we must, we must stand firm in what we do and it will make its impact. It will definitely make its impact. Not necessarily the whole world at one go, but it will make impact because believe me, there among ordinary people, there are many, many good people. So we need to and the good people must come together, encourage each other to, to make their presence felt so that the evildoers, the wrongdoers, they will fear in leading a negative life. That's important. Okay.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you so much, Nelly. Thank you, Gishla. That was the last question today, Gishla. Okay. And thank you so much. Like always, this was such a meaningful, such a helpful session, Gishla. Thank to you. See you next week. See you, everybody. See you, everybody. Have a good weekend. Yeah.